is up in Burke County, not far from Morganton, known as Brown Mountain. It isn't, in truth, much of a mountain, as mountains go, but its fame lies in certain mysterious lights that have long hovered over it during the night. From the Devil's Tramping Ground and other North Carolina mystery stories by John Harden. Hey y'all, I've got a good one for you today. We're going to head out to the mountains of North Carolina and explore a strange phenomenon that's been going on for centuries, but no one has ever been able to figure out why. And because of that, a lot of legends have sprung up over the years to try and explain it. But before we dive into that mystery, I've got some announcements. First of all, I just want to thank y'all for listening because... Earlier this month, we began offering a premium subscription service over on the Apple Podcasts app. And what that means is subscribers get ad-free versions of the show and a monthly bonus episode. Well, honestly, I did not know what to expect when we started the service, but man, I am blown away by how many of you have already signed up for it. So thank you, and I hope you continue to enjoy what's to come. Of course, for those of you who aren't on the Apple Podcast app, please don't feel left out. As I said, you can get access to all of that and more over on Patreon. In fact, there's a ton of extra content over there, so please come and join us if you want to dive deeper into some of these stories. The link for that is in the show notes. Now, as exciting as that, I have something even cooler going on that I would love to invite you to. This summer, I will be performing at the Haunted America Conference in Alton, Illinois just outside of St. Louis. That's right, telling ghost stories. Well, the convention itself is awesome alone. It's my favorite of the year. There are a bunch of speakers talking about ghosts, hauntings, the paranormal, spiritualism, all sorts of stuff, as well as a vendor room with a ton of different authors and oddities type folks, podcasts even. Then to top it all off, there are after hour events like haunted tours and ghost hunts, and of course, us. Well, the convention itself is going to be held on June 23rd through 24th, but I'm going to be slinging stories the night before to kick it all off at the Mineral Springs Hotel on June 22nd. So if you're interested in coming out to the convention, head over to ghostconference.net and come see me. We are going to have an absolute blast. So with that, today's story. In the past, we have covered a number of different mysterious light phenomena, from La Fifale of Cajun folklore to Arkansas's Gurdon Light. And what's been interesting about a lot of these, there really is no denying how frequently folks claim to see these legendary lights, even if the folklore around them can be a little wild or out there. In fact, I believe that in some cases, the stories about these will-of-the-wisp type occurrences might even be making an otherwise natural thing seem paranormal and unbelievable. Yet, in almost all of these cases, the sightings continue. An infamous example of this occurs in the Linville Gorge Wilderness, just east of Asheville, North Carolina. As part of the Pigs and National Forest, This protected wilderness covers over 11,000 acres of land, including steep cliffs, deep gorges, and lush forests. The Linville River runs through it, and the area is popular for activities such as hiking, camping, and rock climbing. But a lot of folks who visit the Linville Gorge also keep their eyes open for something mysterious. They're in search of what has become known as the Brown Mountain Lights. Well over a century, there have been hundreds of eyewitness accounts and even photographs of this infamous occurrence of lights that seemingly dance above the Brown Mountain Ridge without any explanation. But where science has failed to give reason for the phenomenon, legend has taken hold. 
offering explanations from the ghostly and paranormal to the out of this world and even extraterrestrial. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Deep in the heart of the Linville Gorge wilderness lies a mystery that has confounded and eluded scientists, government researchers, and even locals for generations. Along the low-lying ridge of Brown Mountain, strange lights have been spotted hovering in mid-air. And for over a century, countless witnesses have reported seeing these strange orbs of light appearing there. Some say they've seen lights that are so pale they appear white, while others claim to have seen yellow or orange lights or even those of a red and blue hue. But no matter the color, they're most frequently described as being circular in shape, sometimes flickering like flames. And while most often they appear in numbers, some folks have seen it as a simple, single manifestation hovering in the air, rising from the ground, before disappearing into the night sky. The true nature of the brown mountain lights remains a mystery, though there are many theories and legends attempting to explain them. The earliest story of the brown mountain lights purportedly dates back about 800 years, when the land now known as the Linville Gorge was home to the Cherokee people. Legend says that sometime around the year 1200 CE, a fierce battle took place between the Cherokee and the Catawba peoples on Brown Mountain. Many brave men lost their lives in the conflict, and when they failed to come home, the Cherokee women went searching for their beloved. It was then that they stumbled upon this strange, luminous sight. It is said that from that day forward, the brown mountain lights have danced in the night sky, as if marking the location where so much blood had been shed. Purportedly manifestations of the slain warriors, either locked in an eternal battle or searching for their way back home. Some, however, say that the lights are actually the women themselves, heartbroken and perpetually searching for the men that they lost. Another tale that has been passed down through the ages is that of a young girl who lived on Brown Mountain with her father. The girl had met a young man and fallen in love, so every night her sweetheart made his way through the dense wilderness up the mountain to see her, guided only by torchlight. After enough time had passed, the pair decided that they would marry, but when the day came, her groom did not show. Heartbroken, the young woman lit a pine torch every night and roamed the mountains searching for her lost love. Decades passed and she eventually grew old and died. But on stormy nights, it is said that her torch can still be seen flickering through the forest in search of her missing groom. Of course, the details of this story, like who this woman was, or when it happened is unknown, but the recurring theme of the brown mountain lights as lost spirits certainly does not end there. One legend claims that sometime around the 1850s, a woman and her baby disappeared from a local community, leaving behind her husband. Not long after, her neighbors grew suspicious of the man's strange behavior and started to think that he might be responsible for his wife's disappearance. So, they set out to search for her, 
where they suspected he may have disposed of their bodies. As they trekked through the woods, they were suddenly confronted by strange lights that seemed to take a particular interest in the husband. Quickly, they became convinced that this was in fact the spirit of the woman seeking retribution so they declared the man guilty of murder and ended the search for her body. Then, after returning home, the eerie lights continued for some time until finally the husband himself disappeared, never to be heard from again. Years passed and the strange lights were practically forgotten until one day a pile of bones was discovered at the base of a cliff. The remains were determined to be those of the missing woman, whose identity was then confirmed when the mysterious lights reappeared, hovering around the mountain. What is perhaps the most widely known story of the phenomenon came to prominence in the 1950s by way of a song written by Scott Wiseman and recorded with his wife, Myrtle Eleanor Cooper, under the name Lulu Bell and Scotty. As natives of North Carolina, the pair were well aware of the lights and the legends surrounding their origin. The tune was named simply Brown Mountain Light. The lyrics tell the story of a quote, Southern planter who went on a hunting trip through the wilderness of Brown Mountain, but lost his way and never returned home. In an effort to find the missing man, his, quote, faithful old slave took a lantern and searched every night until dawn, but the hunter was never found. According to the song, it is this enslaved man whose spirit still wanders on, and the old lantern still casts its light. By today's standards, the lyrics of Brown Mountain Light are a bit dated and insensitive with their romanticization of slavery and reliance on the trope of the oil slave. However, when it was released, the song was a hit, reaching the top of the country charts and therefore becoming the most prominent version of the legend for an entire generation. Of course, with all of these variations in the Brown Mountain Light's origin story, it's no wonder why their appearance has fascinated folks for years. In the 1950s, North Carolina native newspaperman and author John Harden wrote that he believes the experience of seeing them is a personal one. Quote, the superstitious see in them manifestations of the supernatural. Students of the earth and its formation have tried to explain the mystery through deposits of mineral ore. Boyish pranks have been considered, although it would have been a pretty long drawn out prank. So what then could the mysterious brown mountain lights be, if not a supernatural manifestation? Well, over the last century, many men have tried to figure that out. We'll discuss the history of this extensive search, as well as the numerous scientific theories, and more after the break. Hey, Brianne, so I saw you started using HelloFresh, right? I did. You know, Green Chef is owned by HelloFresh, so I figured I would check it out. And what I realized is that switching between the brands for a wider variety of meal plans is pretty awesome. And now our listeners can get a discount on both. Uh, that's right. HelloFresh is the big daddy of meal kits, isn't it? You get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Yep, because I hate going to the grocery store. Yeah, no kidding. Me too. And you know, by not going to the grocery store all the time, I totally save money with HelloFresh. I mean, the cost of a meal is about 25% cheaper than getting takeout, and I don't end up throwing all those extra snacks and stuff in my basket at the store. Yeah. Well, what did you make? 
Well, this last week, I made a zucchini and tomato flatbread with lemon ricotta, parsley, honey, and chili flakes. I mean, that does sound pretty good. Oh, it totally was. And if you try HelloFresh, you can even stock up on those snacks, sides, desserts in the HelloFresh market. All you have to do is just add the staples and sweets to your weekly order, and they'll arrive at your doorstep along with your meals. It's that simple. That's awesome. So if you too would like to join Brianne and get America's number one meal kit delivered to your door, then I have an exclusive offer for our listeners. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Gothic21 and use code Gothic21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. That's right. Visit HelloFresh.com slash Gothic21 and use code Gothic21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. So did you check out the new show that I sent you? Which one? The Art of Crime. No, I haven't yet, but it sounded pretty cool. The first season was about Jack the Ripper, right? It is, and it is cool. The Art of Crime is a brand new history podcast about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. That's pretty interesting. I know, right? The first season's titled The Unusual Suspects, Artists Accused of Being Jack the Ripper. And what it does is it profiles six renowned artists who have fallen under suspicion for quite possibly being the Whitechapel murderer. Oh yeah? Would I know any of them? I think you would. One of them is Lewis Carroll. You know that, that children's author? Really? Yeah. But there's also some other ones. There's a theatrical wig maker and costume designer who actually supplied Scotland Yard with disguises while it was hunting the Ripper. Then there's an actor who originated the dual role of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and was playing it in London at the time of the killing spree, as well as this Victorian pop star whose brother, it so happens, was also accused of committing the crimes. So what they do on the show is you meet each of these artists, then you find out who they were and what it was like to work in their trades during the Victorian period, as well as why they were nominated as Ripper candidates. And of course, there's the larger question, why have artists, especially these great artists, proven so attractive as suspects? You know, I think I might just need to go listen to that now. You should. And if you dig it, you should subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And make sure to visit artofcrimepodcast.com, or you can go ahead and you can follow them over on Facebook and Instagram. That's the Art of Crime. For more than a century, the mysterious brown mountain lights have captured the attention of researchers, locals, and enthusiasts alike. Yet despite numerous attempts to uncover the truth, every theory proposed so far has fallen short of providing a satisfactory explanation for this enigmatic phenomenon. Of the many theories, one is that the lights are the same as the well-known will of the wisp, a common explanation for occurrences of this nature. The suggestion is that the lights are a result of the spontaneous ignition of swamp gases. But the problem is, Brown Mountain is not located in the type of swampy region that's required for this phenomenon. Another theory is that the lights are similar to St. Elmo's fire, suggesting that they are similar to this form of electrical discharge, which often appears at sea during thunderstorms. Yet this has been easily disputed by the fact that the lights have been seen on clear nights when no storms are present. Then there's the Andes Lights Theory, which posits that the brown mountain lights are caused by silent discharges of electricity passing through the clouds to mountain peaks, as has been seen in South America. However, Brown Mountain is far too low in elevation for this to be a viable option. Other suggestions include the idea that they are similar to a desert mirage, the result of air currents of varying temperatures and densities reflecting light, or possibly even that they are earthquake lights, or earth lights, which are luminous balls of plasma that shoot up from fault lines. 
And what do you know? Brown Mountain does sit atop the Grandfather Mountain Fault, adding credibility to this theory. But still, to this day, no one knows for sure. On the other hand, not all theories are centered in naturally occurring phenomena. Some are just simple, no frills explanation, but the most persistent being that they're nothing more than the light from railroad locomotives and automobiles. In 1913, D.B. Sterrett, a geologist with the United States Geological Survey, concluded exactly this. He claimed that the brown mountain lights were merely headlights from the westbound Southern Railway locomotives, noting that many of these sightings coincided with the train's schedule. Nevertheless, the evidence was dismissed by many. Then, in 1922, as the popularity of the Brown Mountain Lights was growing in the region, scientist George R. Mansfield spent two weeks conducting research from the Lovins Hotel in Cold Springs. The lights were visible from the hotel's premises, making it a popular destination for tourists who wished to witness the phenomenon. So after consulting with local residents on the optimal viewing location, Mansfield set up an Allidade telescope and compass at the hotel and various other spots around the area. These tools enabled the scientists to effectively measure the brown mountain lights for the first time, determining their frequency, distance, probable location, and other relevant factors, allowing him to make a scientifically informed evaluation of their nature. Without a doubt, Mansfield saw what he was looking for, and along with members of the Loven family, he observed it on a number of occasions. The brightness of the lights varied over time, although one seemingly solitary light revealed itself to be not alone through the lens of the telescope. Another light, which Joseph Loven referred to as the true brown mountain light, seemed to move and fluctuate in brightness, but upon closer examination, was determined to be stationary. Yet another series of lights that appeared to move were plotted on a map that showed they followed the path of the Southern Railway and coincided with train schedules. These variations caused one member of the Loven family to express doubt that any of what they had witnessed were of genuine Brown Mountain origin while another deemed the phenomenon to be of an average magnitude. As for George R. Mansfield, he concluded that the lights were, quote, clearly not of unusual nature or origin, further specifying that the sightings consisted of about 47% automobile headlights, 33% locomotive headlights, and 10% each of stationary lights and brush fires. Of course, not unsurprisingly, the local community was not satisfied with Manfield's results. Most were quick to point out that the lights could not be related to cars or trains because in 1916, a flood washed the roads and railroad tracks on the mountain and the lights were still seen. The Lenoir News reached out to hotel owner George Anderson Lovin to confirm this, and he responded positively that as of September, they were in fact still seen nightly on the mountain. On the other hand, George might have been a little biased here. After all, his business made some of its money from visitors coming to view the phenomenon from his property. Either way, the continuation of the lights after the 1916 flood has been a consistent talking point for those who believe the Brown Mountain lights have nothing to do with modern technology. Yet there is one of Mansfield's findings that has had a significant impact on our perception of the lights. Through conversations with members of the local communities, the scientists determined that the majority of residents were not aware of any unusual lights until around 1910 or later. This period is noteworthy for two reasons. First, in 1909, 
the Southern Railway Company upgraded their locomotive headlamps to lights with 600,000 candle power systems, making the light output brighter than some lighthouses of the era. Secondly, this was a time when electric lighting was rapidly spreading through the Linville Gorge area. The first known published reference to the phenomenon predated Mansfield's study, though. On September 1, 1913, the Charlotte Daily Observer wrote, The mysterious light seen just above the horizon almost every night from Rattlesnake Knob near Cold Spring on the Morgantown Road about seven miles from here is still baffling all investigators. With punctual regularity, the light rises in a southeastern direction from the point of observation just over the slope of Brown Mountain. First, about 7.30 p.m., again, about 20 or 30 minutes later, and again at 10 o'clock. The punctual regularity of these lights tracked well with the known train schedules. But not every description of the lights in the early 1900s were quite as specific with times. Most descriptions typically identified them as, quote, unknown distant lights visible to the east over the top of Brown Mountain when viewed from observation sites in the higher mountains to the west and northwest. Some today would point out that electric lights from other communities can be seen from vantage points over the mountain, and perhaps in those early days of electrification, some just didn't realize what they were looking at. Nevertheless, in the decades following Mansfield's study, there was a boom in the publication of origin stories about the lights that purported they predate the railroad and electrical grid, some of which we referenced earlier in this episode. In the 1930s, the Works Progress Administration published the Guide to the Old North State, which proclaimed that the Brown Mountain Lights had, quote, puzzled scientists for 50 years, documenting sightings of the phenomenon prior to the Civil War. That being said, the guide was created by sending writers to gather oral histories from local communities, which were then recorded as written accounts with no fact-checking or sources provided so the claims are a bit questionable. Then, in 1936, the first documented ghost story linking the lights to a tragic event was published. This was the tale of the murderous husband, whose treachery was affirmed by his wife's vengeful spirit manifested as the lights. It wasn't until 1938 that the Cherokee people were linked to the Brown Mountain Lights when the previously told story about the fierce battle was published in the Asheville Citizen. Of course, this too lacks sources or fact-checking, and many experts on Native culture and tradition have dismissed this myth as a fabrication based on stereotypical beliefs about the Cherokee culture. As for the story told in Scott Wiseman's song, Brown Mountain Light, well, it was said to have originated from what he had heard firsthand growing up in the region. He later recounted the tale of his great uncle, Josiah Fate Wiseman, who allegedly had an encounter with the mysterious lights in 1854. According to the songwriter, while on a camping trip with his father as a boy, Fate saw a flash of light in the distance that reappeared in the same location each and every night. Although, while the story was said to have occurred around 1850, it was never published until 1971, and even then, this telling is of the remembrances of what was told to Scott Wiseman as a young teen from his roughly 80-year-old family member about events that occurred 60 to 70 years prior. Today, many people consider the definitive proof of the longevity of the Brown Mountain Lights to be the report of the General Survey in the Southern District of North America 
presented to King George III in 1771. This was written by John William Gerard de Brom, who was a military engineer, cartographer, mystic, and, quote, eccentric genius. In the report surveying what is now the southeastern United States, he includes the following line. In a heavy atmosphere, the nitrous vapors are swallowed up through the sporaculus of the mountains, and thus the country is cleared from their corrosion. When the atmosphere is light, these nitrous vapors rise up to the arsenical and sulfurous, subliming through the expiracles of the mountains. And when they meet with each other in contact, the nitre in flames vulgarates and detonates. The Gastonia Daily Gazette was the first to link to Brahms' work in the Brown Mountain Lights in 1927, as naturally vapors igniting into flaming balls atop a mountain fit into the description of these unexplained lights. The problem with this connection, though, is that it isn't accurate. In general, de Brahms' writings relies heavily on alchemical descriptions. He doesn't simply come out and describe something as it is seen. Rather, he attempts to describe the entire process. In the case of the nitrous vapors, the description is part of a significantly more extensive description of the cause of thunderstorms and clean mountain air. Additionally, de Brahms lived and traveled in East Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. There's actually no evidence to suggest that he ever traveled through North Carolina, and most of all, the mountain that the passage describes is located in the section of the report about South Carolina. Clearly, then, we have no concrete evidence to suggest exactly when the brown mountain lights were first seen on that infamous ridge. Of course, there is one final explanation as to the origin of this infamous light phenomenon. Author and folklorist Nancy Brown wrote of it in her 1979 book, Southern Ghosts. Perhaps the most exciting explanation of all for the lights has been overlooked. In recent years, the theory has been advanced that the mystery lights are UFOs and that this remote area is a gathering place for the flying saucers whose extraterrestrial beings use them to land and later take off. This particular explanation is quite popular today. In fact, the Brown Mountain Lights even made an appearance on the classic TV show, The X-Files. But interestingly, Ms. Roberts didn't cite this in her chapter on the lights from her earlier work, Ghosts of the Carolina Coast, from 1964, suggesting that this new extraterrestrial element did not get entangled into the war until the UFO movement of the 1960s. One pulp magazine, The Argosy, actually included an article encouraging people to go see the UFOs at Brown Mountain, and even more telling, is that reports of these lights began to feature similar themes to those of close encounters, with glowing spheres that floated in the air. This is a particularly interesting development because early stories of the light focused more on reports from a distance. Of course, whether this explanation is true or not, is up for debate just as much as the tales of Cherokee warriors or scientific theories. It seems the only thing that we can really say for sure when it comes to the Brown Mountain Lights is that the legend has certainly evolved over time as cultural beliefs and explanations have changed. While the origin of the Brown Mountain Lights remains a mystery, the sightings continue. And to this day, folks still come from all over to see them in person. Almost a century after Lovin's Hotel became a destination for those intrigued by it. In fact, 
If anyone is interested in experiencing the brown mountain lights for themselves, locals say they are most likely to be seen in October and November on clear, dry nights from one of the many scenic overlooks in Pigza National Forest. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is produced by siblings Brian and Brandon Schecksneider and made possible through the support of listeners like you. If you're interested in receiving ad-free episodes and additional content, be sure to join us over on Patreon or become a premium subscriber on Apple Podcasts. Of course, if you're already a supporter or just looking for a free way to help Southern Gothic grow, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app or sharing an episode on social media to help lure some other folks into the swamp. We'd greatly appreciate it. Southern Gothic is also a member of Airwave, a curated podcast network featuring some of the leading storytellers in audio entertainment, including other chart-topping podcasts like Ben Franklin's World and Redacted History with Andre White. Lucky Lady Shacks.